Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today is an episode I've been really excited about for a very long time. I'm joined by Jay and Nick Jones from Noble and Cooley. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, I mean, I'm telling you, this is the most requested episode. I would say at least two times a month for the last year and a half, someone has said, hey, have you thought about doing Noble and Cooley? Um, and uh, to answer everyone's question, yes, I had thought about it. <laughs> and these are just very busy guys um, who are just constantly making drums. Um, and I was fortunate enough to meet Nick at the last Chicago show. And mm-hmm. um, he kind of gave me a little... Uh, you give me a little taste of, yeah, we'd love to do it. And then, <laughs> yeah, I know. I feel like I've misled you for like a year. You've been, you've been tracking us down to make this happen. And, uh, that's okay. Took that's a while. Okay. I, uh, I always thought I was like, man, I hope I'm not being a pest, but when I, I just, you know, I don't give up. I think that's the, the, the key and, and we're here and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be awesome. So yeah. Um, well let's give the people what they want. Um, why don't we start off with just, talking about your family's company, which is um, just one of the oldest drum companies in the country, if I'm not mistaken. I don't want to misspeak and say something wrong, but Jay, why don't you just lay it on us? Tell us about the history of Noble and Cooley. All right. Well, I think it's fairly safe to say we are the oldest current active uh, drum company in the country. Um, The way it all got started was back in 1853. Uh, Mr. Noble made some toy drums for his friends and family for Christmas and thought he had a good idea and joined his buddy, Mr. Cooley, who happens to be my great, great, great grandfather. And they incorporated the business in January 1854. It was founded as a toy company, um, but we have made toys every year of our existence since then. Um, The first year they were together, they made 631 drums. Shortly after the Civil War, they had a factory, 18 employees, and they made over 80,000 drums in 1873, Uh, along with with, um, uh, croquet sets, cigar lighters, toothpicks, a bunch of other little wooden items. So when you say 80, and you said in the 1870s, 80,000 drums, are you talking about real drums or toy drums? It was a combination. It was a combination toy, uh, toys and military marching drums. Wow. Uh, We we were uh, one of the... uh, manufacturers that were making the contract snare drums for the Civil War uh, for the Union regiments. That is so cool. So that's so cool to me because it it happened in World War II. It's happened other times, but by contract, I mean, you, the government literally came and said, we need drums. That's right. They gave a a contract out for uh, 16 inches in diameter, 12 inches deep, um, so many uh, uh, leather ears on it. And as long as we met those specs, they would buy them from us. Wow. That had to be great for business. I mean, I'm sure they, you don't have any, you know, he can't, he didn't, (laughs) that's, that's very long ago to have like firsthand knowledge of, yeah, the business, but obviously that is probably what kept the business going. If, if it went the other way and, um, you didn't get a contract, maybe Noble and Cooley wouldn't be here today. Well, I don't know. The toys were probably still the predominant product. Okay. Um, Okay. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. So um, do you know any stories of was it hard to keep up with production making that many drums? Was it like uh, how they say with Ludwig, they were doing 24 hour shifts once Ringo, you know, happened to make that many drums. They had to be (laughs) cranking them out. Right. Right. But it was it was a toy product. It was not a lot of uh, precision involved. Uh, Um, It was, uh, you know, crank them out to add more people to the mix. Got it. Wow. Okay. So um, now, and we should probably say that you guys have always been located in Massachusetts, correct? Correct. We've always been located in Granville, uh, Massachusetts. The original factory was a quarter mile from its current uh, location. Um, The original factory burned down in January of 1889. Uh, But between 1854 and 1889, another drum company, toy company, was operating in Granville. And after the fire, with the insurance money, we purchased their uh, factory and property and built the three main buildings that we're still using today on that site. Gotcha. Um, Do you know of any, I mean, I feel like it's so long ago, like I said, but was there any... um, they, they probably had to do a little bit of learning to go from making a toy drum to actually making a 
rope tension drum that was going to be used, you know, in battle. I guess there might have been like a, a little bit of a learning curve there, right? Maybe there was. I'm sure there was a curve, but it wasn't a very big one because yeah. for the the toys at that time were. Uh, steam bent wooden shells with skin heads. So oh, all they had to do was scale it up to a larger diameter, a little thicker wood, uh, uh, heavier uh, oak uh, uh, hoops. Um, sure. it, it was just you know, more of the same, just a little larger. Yeah. Now, um, a great friend of the show, Mark Robertson, who I believe you guys know and has done some work with you, he um, – he has turned me on to more of like looking into and appreciating the rope tension drums. Do you come across a lot of these drums from that Civil War era today that are still around? I mean, and, and collectible, they, they have to be very, really valuable. Right. Uh, we don't see a lot of them. Uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, we were able to purchase one uh, from an estate that uh, was being broken up. Then the drum was actually uh, actually served in the Civil War and it was picked up off the Gettysburg battlefield. Uh, so we have that in a glass case here. Uh, back then, we also made a drum for President Lincoln's campaign uh, for presidency. We had sent to Illinois and got a fenced rail that he had split years before. And when it came in, we machined it into strips to make the wood hoops for the drum. It was oh then uh, painted with a likeness of Lincoln on it, strung with sterling silver hooks and silk cord. Um, and my great, great, great grandfather's diary entry in August of 1863 said, finish the Lincoln drum today, the finest thing ever made. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> wow. So it goes without saying that your great, 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 great grandfather was a drummer obviously is that fair to say i don't know that's a great question <laughs> um there's there's no record or indication of that one would assume somebody had to have been at some point but yeah there's no evidence of that unfortunately because of the company fire we lost all the company records Gosh, uh were lost in the fire but what we do have are the family diaries that hmm. were that kept uh he kept a, a one diary of all the daily events, and my grandmother took the time to go through and transpose all the business entries from the family entries. So we have a concentrated history of the major events in the company prior to 1889. Gotcha. Okay. Now, um, would Mr. Noble, so his family, and, and I don't want to move too far ahead, but I'm assuming just going through the years, the Noble side of things like maybe they just got bought out or a lot or the family. I mean, this is that's a hundred plus years ago that just had to have maybe, maybe they just stopped being involved or how did that separation happen? Uh, they stayed involved right up until about 1921 when they didn't okay. have any heirs left and uh, they decided to sell out to uh, the coolies at that point in time. And we, got it. you know, obviously kept the same name moving forward. Okay. Got it. Okay. So, um, Oh, man. Anything else while we're in that Civil War era that's really cool? Because that, that's just such a neat... Um, I mean, there there was other competition. There was I, would, I don't want to call them competition because I guess it was a government contract, so you're not really competing for work. But there were other manufacturers of drums at that point in time. Do you know, would they be regional? Would, would, like, would Noble and Cooley make drums for sort of like that region of like you know, I guess it would be New England or would they be making drums and sending them across, you know, the union or any, any info on that? I'm not really sure. Um, I know there were several other drum manufacturers in the area in Connecticut that were making drums for the Civil War at the same time. Um, I don't know if all the uh, production from the companies were being central, uh, sent to a central location and then distributed across the uh, union. I'm not sure how that worked. Okay, Awesome. Um, there's a cool episode just so people can check out with Patrick Jones that was, um, you know, a little while back about the history of U.S. military drumming that talks a lot about rope tension drums. Um, so people can, if this is kind of scratching their, uh, or, or it's giving them an itch to hear more about rope tension stuff in the civil war, they can check that out. Um, but wow, it's so interesting to think so many drums were made at that time. And um, just like thinking what happens to these drums, obviously they're probably destroyed in battle. They're um, lost to fires. They're lost to floods. And, you know, you just, they're not that prevalent nowadays. So that's cool. You have a few. 
Well, that drum that we made for Lincoln's campaign uh, was presented to the first Massachusetts regiment to serve in the Civil War. And from mm. there, we lost track of it. Uh, <laughs> wow. There was a rumor that it found its way to the U.S. Patent Office. The National Geographic Society tried to help us locate it back in the 1960s to no avail. Um, it could have been destroyed in the war, but it could be in somebody's attic and turned up next week. So we're always sort of looking for it. That's the fun of it is like, you know, you 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 like pray that it's not gone. I know um, Klaus Hessler on here talked about Jim Chapin had a rope tension drum in his front seat of his car and he left it unlocked when he was uh, shooting his, his you know, really famous instructional video and someone stole it. And um, you just think these things have to be out there. People don't, I hope they don't just throw them away. So um, the hunt continues. But uh, all right. So after that era, so let's say that takes us up through what you said that did you say the the um the original factory burned down in what was it 1889 is that correct right? mm-hmm. okay so then they have to rebuild it is their mindset now we're still a toy company at that point Basically, i mean obviously you, yes, you still you know, are but okay yeah uh it was the volume of the toys that kept everything going uh, like i said we've manufactured sure. toys drums every year of our existence yeah um And obviously, the marketing of the toys has changed over the years from jobbers to distributors to freestanding to now it's all internet. Uh, So we had to change with the times in order to uh, stay in business. Which is interesting because now, for me, I think of you guys, and I think most people listening to this show think of you as a drum company. Obviously, you, you, you always have been, but... Um, it must have been flip flopped back then. They where they say, "Oh, Noble and Cooley, the toy company," almost like um, not Fisher Price. That's kind of a major, major toy. But you know what I mean, where you think of them as a toy company. Um, I mean, for sure, if you look at the badge off of one of our modern drums, you know, the Solid Shell Classic, kind of our most iconic snare that we make. The badge still it doesn't say what series it is, but it identifies the drum as the music division. So I'm like sure. we we were a separate toy company and pro drum company and the early yeah. badges on the drums indicated that. And yeah. we didn't let we didn't try let the music industry know that just that we were basically a toy company that's trying to break into the music industry. That's why it was the music division. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's um that's interesting. It's kind of a tough um but you have the history though. Like like at that point of trying to break into the to you know into the drum world but like you're older than every single company that's in existence <laughs> so yeah but, like, but think of the mindset back then what's this toy company think you know, what do they know about making uh professional drums yeah so we try to kept we played that low key and uh obviously we it, it yeah. worked well that's interesting too because like you think of like uh let's say in the 80s or 90s you think of like mattel or um <clears throat> Like there were companies who were making, you know, they had commercials uh, and I'm it's going to escape me now the actual which one it was. But Buddy Rich was in some commercials um, for oh, these Buddy, little, like. Yeah, Buddy Rich was on one of our toy drum sets. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> we act, in the 70s through the 90s, we were supplying all the toy drums for Toys R Us, Child World, JCPenney, Sears. Uh, we had 120 yeah. people spread over two shifts just you know, keeping up with the demand. Gosh, wow. You know, I've um, I've looked into him because I have a uh, he's now 14 or 15 months. Basically, I have a one year old and I'm like, for this Christmas, I'm going to get him a, some sort of noble and cooley drum. I think I I tried last year and it, I think you guys sold out or, or something. I couldn't find one. But um, they um, I love the vintage ones. But before we get there, let's back up, you know, 100 years here. So 1889. <laughs> so we're in the early 1900s at that point. Basically, you have they're, they're building the new factory. Uh, which you said is where you currently are now, correct? Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's the layout of it like? I mean, why don't you tell us a little bit about your your the factory maybe then and now, um, so we can picture it a little bit. All right. The uh, the three main buildings that were built between 1889 and ni- uh, 1906, I believe it was, uh, are four story wood frame uh, timber frame buildings, tin roofs. Uh, they were all connected together with bridges at the second and third floor. Uh, so everything could be transferred, you know, from one side of the street to the other without having without having to cross the road. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, it had a nice flow. The, the warehouse was a left hand building. The manufacturing with the taller ceilings were in the uh, the other two, um, and it was you know pretty nicely laid out. And 
We mm-hmm. continue to grow over the years. We have over 12 buildings now, but they were just a hodgepodge addition of different buildings. Uh, for Because we were a little paranoid of fire after having the one in 89, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the boiler house was kept separate. It was a separate building for the boilers. Uh, wow. And the steam was piped in. So if the boiler blew up, which it did in 1928, uh, we didn't lose any of the manufacturing buildings. Oh, wow. Yeah. How many employees Let's say at that point in, um, you know, the early days, how many employees would they have at that point? Uh, we have pictures from the 1890s, the early 1900s, about 70 employees. Wow. I mean, that's a serious company. I mean, how many employees do you guys have now? I, th- I think there's five of us. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's more of a small shop, but that's because you guys... We're going back. We're going modern and, and, and historical here and jumping back and forth. So that's because you guys now... Right. You still make toy drums, correct? But it's not what it was where you're like the leading manufacturer <laughs> churning out. You know. No, no. Uh, we saw the the handwriting on the wall in the 1980s. The, that was when the migration of the toys started to head overseas. Uh, so to stay a viable supplier in the toy industry, we started importing other musical toys, kazoos, harmonicas, um, the um, pianos. Uh, cool. And... We were we had so if Sears or Pennies wanted a, a toy music category, they could get everything from us: a little marching drum, a little drum set, a little piano, cool. guitar, harmonica, yeah. whatever. It kept us a viable supplier to the toy industry, right up wow. until uh, two thousand or one. Uh, after nine eleven, both Pennies and Sears canceled all their orders because they figured there was not going to be any catalog business that year, yeah. which was fine for them, but it stuck us with 24 containers of pre-purchased Chinese crap arriving daily for that six-week <laughs> Christmas ship window. Oh, my gosh. So Jeez. that was that was pretty much the end of the uh, the toy business. Uh, yeah, you got burned. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. we are still making a uh, small toy drum, uh, an embossed tin drum for yep. Colonial Williamsburg, Vermont Country Store. Um, it's a drum uh, design that we've had in line since 1914. Um, and what we do now in a year, my mother would used to assemble in about two days. Oh, man. You know, and I just think, too, it's like, um, you know, well, no, I was going to say, well, the, the times have changed and kids have changed and it's a different time. But I do think, you know, maybe my son is really young and he still plays with a little drum and he plays on my drums. But. I think once they get to a certain age, technology has obviously made it more like, you know, their kids are probably more interested in, you know, their tablet and their video games as opposed to like, um, but listen, I mean, I sound like an old man. So yeah, sure but you're not don't. wrong. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. When you got those shipments of stuff and you switched um, and you were selling to like pennies and, um, you know, the other the other stores would they say Noble and Cooley or would you put like a different brand on them, what, whoever they wanted, or was it always Noble and Cooley still? It was pretty much Noble and Cooley. Uh, we put stickers on the little guitars that came in, uh, but it was, yeah. You know, some things were not branded. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. There's unbranded, just generic. Correct. Chi- like made in China kind of drum. Okay. So, um, all right. Now, early 1900s, were they still, were you guys, I'll say, were you guys still making um, like snare drums, dr- like drum drums, like musical drums at that point? Or did it kind of switch back to just, we're back to being a toy company? Uh, the military drums lasted until around 1910 to 1920. Uh, okay. that, that's when they phased out. And then we went back to basically all toys. Okay, so they were in... I think my dates are right there. They were in World War One. People would be using Noble and Cooley um, drums. Poss- possibly, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, I think that goes back to the question of um, drums were in the Civil War used for communication and for rallying troops, and then you get into more modern warfare, and there was radio communication, correct? Bigger artillery. So I guess that sort of. I think when I uh, in previous episodes, people have just kind of said it just phased out a little bit to have it. Yeah. It was a little old school to have mm-hmm. marching drummers. Um, Correct. Okay. So 
1920, you guys then switch back to being a toy company, as you just said. So um, take us there. What what happened then through that, you know, next couple decades? Oh, it's I mean, just really the next couple decades there saw the evolution in product material and manufacturing techniques. You know, as as my dad said earlier, we started off doing everything wood, steam bent, you know, veneers that were glued together and using stretched uh, hide heads. And then, you know, as, and everything was steam powered. Um, and eventually we switched over to doing tin mm-hmm. and printing on the tin ourselves. You know, it originally would have been wood burned and embossed and hand painted on wood, which then switched to tin that we had built a three color printing press for that we would be doing designs and artwork on that, which eventually evolved into our own custom, uh, like protected eight color printing press that we made. Um, so it was more the like manufacturing revolution that was kind of sweeping over the world at that time, kind of came through our door as well, switching from water and steam power to more modern techniques and therefore materials being used along with it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's fascinating. Just, uh, I mean, those early wooden toy drums, they sound like beautiful little toys. You know what I mean? <laughs> like real heads. And I mean, they sound amazing but very time intensive to make those right Uh, we started making the tin drums around 1900 Uh, and as nick alluded to the the uh the technology was not good enough to actually print on the steel very well without it flaking off so in order to decorate the drums they would emboss it actually press the pattern right into the tin Mm -hmm. um and then we developed our own three color printing press in 1910 and then our own eight color uh offset printing press in 1926. Got it. Got it. That's interesting. Man, you must have been leaders in the technology pushing that stuff forward. And um, and this is all American made, obviously. So it's kind of pre um, the overseas boom of things being made um, in China and in Japan. So it's just the craftsmanship is, is, you know, not what they not what you see today in toy drums. Right. And, you know, that printing press that we designed uh, was kept a trade secret. Uh, It was never patented because once you patent something, it becomes public knowledge. People can look up your patent, see how, uh, look at your drawings that you had to submit to get your patent and figure, oh, that's how they're doing it (laughs) and build something similar. So our printing press was kept in a locked room. Only the owners and the pressmen were allowed in for the first 10 years. Uh, It took our production capacity from on a five color print would take uh, two to three weeks to make a couple thousand pieces with a three color press. And you could do uh, 1,200 pieces before lunch every day with the eight color press. Wow. Is that technology, I'm assuming since that time, is it still a secret or did that kind of come out and become, um, you know, do people know what it is now? Is that <laughs> like, is oh, it yeah, out well, it, It's basically a, an offset pre- uh, printing press. Okay. Uh, I gave a tour to the Society of Industrial Archaeologists several years ago, and they had a guest with them. Uh, her name was Helena Wright from the Smithsonian, and her field of expertise was printing and lithography. Hmm. And we were actually running the press for this tour group, and she was in absolute awe seeing this 1926 antique machine doing the print quality job that was that we were uh, producing. Hmm. And she she said, you have a one of a kind piece here. And I basically told her, well, we only had to build one. <laughs> uh, but what she meant was in her field of expertise, she's never seen another eight color offset press this old. She believes wow. it's probably one of the first ones in existence. Jeez, that's unbelievable. Do you, does it still operate right now? Oh, sure. I can, uh, you know, put some ink in it and ink it up oh. and go ahead and print. Yeah, it's currently sitting in our museum. Um, sure. So, I mean, it's not hooked up at the moment, but we could put a belt back on it and have it running in a couple hours. Wow. And it's like 100, it is basically 100 years old. I mean, that's... Yeah, 1926. <laughs> yep. Okay, coming up on that. Wow. Unbelievable. It's um, the drum, it's it's just crazy that it was for toy drums. You know what I mean? That kind of technology. But um, it, it obviously... Uh, you know, it made you guys stand out and be able to produce all these little little tin drums. And uh, and and this might be a crazy thought, but maybe that led to we're talking the 19, you know, 1926, 1930. 
drums are booming. Gene Krupa's out there. Papa Joe Jones is playing. Um, drums are becoming more popularized. Kids go and buy toy drums because that's their first attainable thing. So, I mean, really, you guys are part of the history of, um, you know, creating this, these drum crazy, you know, nerds like all of us where they're obsessed with drums, (laughs) you know? Uh, I I look at it as we were seeding the drum industry with the uh, toys. Yeah. Yeah. We we still get people approaching us at trade shows or, you know, just sending emails every now and then, or sometimes just sending photos of like, I found this old photo of me on my very first kit. And it's, you know, a noble and coolie kit that they got for Christmas when they were five years old, you know, in the 1950s. Um, it, It still happens all the time. Actually, one of the guys we just, hired here has a photo that his mom had took Christmas morning with his first kit and it's a noble and cooley toy kit. Hmm. Now let's real quick. Cause now if we're talking about a toy kit, so it would be, and let's just say for example, um, the, the guy who you just hired who like, so it's a little bass drum, little snare. What does the drum set actually look like? It has a little seat. I mean, it's not just a toy <laughs> snare, right? It's an actual. No, kit. it's a, it's a bass drum, uh, that has the Tom Tom bolted to it and a, a tone block bolted to the top of that with a couple of wires to hold a couple of pressed tin cymbals. It was okay. you know, very, very quick and easy to put together. Uh, the assembly would put together between 80 and a hundred dozen drum sets a day. Oh my God. That's a ton. Wow. And then it's nice and easy for, you know, mom or dad to set up when they get home. It's not like a real drum set where dad can't figure out the hi-hat. and (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, you do still have to, you know, there's there's some wig nuts and some bolts involved and, you know, a little bit of assembly involved when you take it out of a box. But, yeah, basically everything would attach to one central bass drum. And then, yes, it would come with a a throne and some sticks and a cymbal or two. Yeah. And I've, I've seen, I think I saw in maybe like, reverb or ebay or something you know you'd have like your different front bass drum head that had like daffy duck on it or something like that and you, mm-hmm. your c- cartoon characters um cool okay so let's fast forward then um you tell me when to stop so how long did it then continue on so we were in the 50s there a little bit like when did it maybe switch to uh you know you guys making the amazing, beautiful drums that we know today, or where were there any other big monumental changes in that, you know, half century from the fifties to the two thousands when you got all the shipping containers that you couldn't do anything with? Uh, well, uh, let's see. My, my dad tried to uh, start a giftware line uh, to try to smooth out the peaks and valleys of you know, a toy company has one peak at Christmas, mm-hmm. uh, uh, giftwares and housewares has a peak in June, so it's a very nice offset. So we made drum-themed uh, ice buckets, waste baskets, lamps, cutting boards, and that sort of thing, which added a second line, uh, another uh, income stream to the company. Until, as you brought up earlier, the rock and roll hit when the Beatles hit. Mm-hmm. At that point in time, every kid wanted to be Ringo. Uh, and the toy production took off to the point where we had to take over every square foot of manufacturing space to make the toy drums. Uh, so the giftware just got pushed right out of business. And wow. during that period of time, the uh, 60s through the 90s, we put three or four additions on the on the plant, you know, from warehousing to manufacturing, uh, just to keep up with that demand. Uh, Man, but, unbelievable. You know, I, I started here full time in 1972-ish. Um, that's official. I was used to walk down from the grade schools when I was in fourth grade, so <laughs> I've been here forever. Yeah. Um, and doing the same toy stuff over and over again got to be boring. Uh, and a gentleman came to me with uh, in 1980. Um, he had a cracked Slingerland Radio King, and his wife had gotten a, one of our waste baskets or ice buckets that had a steam bent wooden hoop on it. So he came in and asked me if I could make him a new shell. And I took a look at it and said, I don't see why not. And he convinced me that uh, every recording artist worth anything was scouring tag sales pawn shops trying to find these solid wood steam bent drum shells of the pre-Second World War era. So that was an idea. And I was very, very, very fortunate to be able to start the music division of the company being financed by the toy side of the company. Uh, So that's how we morphed 
into the company that we are now. So after uh, 9-11 and the toys basically went away, we had still had a viable product and a, a workforce that was uh, continuing to move it forward. And here we are. Unbelievable. I mean, I just think rewinding a little bit and everyone who listens to the show, it just, it's, it's amazing how much Ringo comes up in places that you wouldn't imagine um, of like for you guys. I mean, your production blowing up because of the Beatles and because of Ringo, it's just, it's, it affected uh, everything, which is so cool. Um, okay. So, and you said that was in the eighties that the music division was actually um, more or less created. Correct. The, uh, 1980, 81 is when I built the first prototype of our classic snare. Um, and I being young and brash, uh, Buddy Rich was playing in a near t- uh, close by town, and I took my prototype, uh, stuck it under my arm, went out behind the Simsbury High School where his bus was, and knocked on the bus door. Um, he, and uh, he actually was very gracious. He invited me in and said, what do, you, what do you want? And I showed him my prototype, and he tapped on it, and he told the uh, tour manager to put it on the stage. So I was ecstatic. Uh, <laughs> so, here, you know, Buddy Rich is going to play my prototype. Uh, so we go out in the audience. Well, everything that could go wrong did go wrong that first set. Uh, it was obviously it was a high school pr- uh, production. Uh, kids were trying to get the lighting right. The lights are going on and off. He stopped and yelled at it, people. Um, <laughs> he was playing. Uh, he was playing one set list, and the rest of the band was on another set list. So every time he started something, they all started shuffling the music. So oh. come intermission time, he was not in a very good mood. Uh, so when I went back to the bus after, the tour manager said, no, you don't want to go in there right now. Uh, but he brought me in and said, it sounds like a tub. I can't hear it from where I'm sitting. <laughs> so, uh, Oh, man, and, you, that's unbelievable. So I was crushed at that point. But then he said, as I was leaving the bus, he goes, but uh, you're on the right track. Refine it and make it better. So. Wow. So that was my, oh, you know, took my prototype to to Buddy Rich, and that was, and that's how we hooked up with Buddy Rich, and he became one of our pictures on our toy set, and an actual um, lesson book was incorporated in that drum set with lessons from him. Man, I mean, did you tell him like my family has been making toy drums since before the Civil War to give you a little bit of like. Um, clout. You know what I mean? Did you kind of? I I would have. I sure as hell would have mentioned that to kind of just say like, listen, we were. Did you give him the whole story? I'm just curious. You know. Uh, no. Wait, I had like three minutes between <laughs> the time I knocked on the door and the time he had to go get on stage. So no, oh, there's not wow. much, not much story involved there at all. Sure, and I love the idea or the the image of Buddy Rich yelling at a bunch of high schoolers for screwing up the production. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you are the lights. Go home. That's a quote. <laughs> oh, wow, buddy. Man, I was going to say, of course he handled it calmly and uh, was mm. a nice guy. <laughs> Jeez, that is unbelievable. But you didn't give up. No. You, th- that, maybe that last bit of advice from buddy is, is what, you know, that he left you on a high note, right? That's, that's right. That's a good thing. And uh, that, you know, right around that time, I hooked up with Bob Gatson from Creative Music in Wethersfield. Um, he had a percussion shop. Um, he was a uh, professionally trained uh, uh, percussionist. And he had a set of ears uh, that would, you know, I had to trust because I'm not a drummer. Uh, and he, I'd make prototypes, he'd refine them, we'd make changes. And over the next two or three years, we ended up with our solid wood maple classic, which uh, we are still making today. Yeah. Okay, now pause there, because you, you said something, and I don't think, <clears throat> I think that sometimes people think that you have to be a drummer to make drums or work <laughs> for a drum company or work at a drum store. So you yourself are not a drummer. No, I am definitely not a drummer. Uh, okay. I, I, I don't do, I'm not a musician of anything. I like to say I play the radio. Gotcha. Uh, now, actually, w- working with Bob Gatson, that turned out to be a pretty good thing because not being a drummer, 
I didn't have any preconceived thoughts of what a drum should be, how it should yeah. be built, how things should go together. Um, sure. He threw a problem at me, and I just figured out the way I thought it should be figured out. Got so. it. Yeah. Now, do you classify yourself then as more of a like I am a woodworker, I am a manufacturer? Is that more of like what you would say your you know thing is in in all of this? Yeah, uh, I like to build things. I've always Got liked it. to build things. So, oh, yeah. and I, I like it, my, awesome. my hands on it. I like to build the equipment to uh, you know, simplify and make things better. Um, and Nick has an ongoing list all the time of things he'd like improved upon. So I get to uh, tinker in the machine shop and build new equipment all the time. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. And now, so Nick, obviously the, you know, Jade's son, the next generation of this stuff, uh, you are a drummer and obviously you, you have some studio stuff. So I'm assuming you work with audio engineering, uh, you know, stuff as well. But Nick, you were a drummer then, correct? This is going to kill you. No, I'm not. <laughs> Who's the drummer? No, I'm kidding. My brother. Um, my brother is the drummer is the short answer to this story. Um, that's so funny. Wow. He's a couple years older than I am. He got the bug to play drums early on in life. And, you know, we grew up wanting to play in bands together. We grew up, you know, in the Nirvana era of the power trio. And, you know, when he was on drums, we didn't need a second drummer in the family. So I started on guitar, eventually moved okay. to bass, and that's kind of where I still stay. Um, awesome. I built myself a drum kit. I built myself two drum kits now. I can't play them to save my life. Um, that's so I, I don't have the coordination and also the time, which is the more important factor there, to really develop to be able to do two hands and two feet at the same time. You know, I'm, I'm good if you yeah. give me just feet or just hands, but as soon as I try to introduce a third element, I fall apart. And I, I don't have the time to dedicate towards practicing. That wouldn't wow, take away from building drums. It's fascinating that you guys are making some of the finest drums in the world. And maybe part of it is that you aren't, like, like Jay said, where you aren't drummers and you can like, look at it with a different, um, you know, different eyes and, and treat things differently and not get stuck in, um, the like, no, it's, it's, we do it this way because we've always done it this way sort of thing. And, and, right. uh, that's so cool. I'm, we do I'm, also uh, surround ourselves with drummers. Um, of everybody that we hire is a drummer. It's not part of a required like job application <laughs> by any means. Uh, it just, I mean, Saying you work for a drum company tends to attract a certain demographic, most of which of are drummers. Um, so it's it's pretty easy to keep that as one of those things that we have for everybody else that comes through. So, you know, if we're building yeah. a new prototype or something, obviously I can tell when I tune it up and hit it like, oh, hey, this, this particular drum sounds terrible. Uh, we should go back to the drawing board on it. But having sure. an extra set of ears or two or three around here that, you know, can take it down and really dive into it and you know play with some nuances yeah. that it delivers it is very helpful to have absolutely but you, like you said to tune it up um and hit it doesn't require you to be a lifelong drummer you know what sounds good um, right yeah i have the ear for it i mean i can tune a drum and, and hit it and tell what it sounds like that's that's not a problem it's the introducing the beat keeping ability of coordination oh, sure. that i fall apart at yeah. yeah man i think that's so cool it's just like um, it's very interesting, uh, that you don't have to be, uh, like you don't have to be a race car driver to work on cars. I mean, that's a horrible example because you probably wouldn't know how to drive, but <laughs> right. No, but you're, you're right. And, you know, especially with a company as old as ours, that is a family company that passes down through generations. It, I mean, it, it seems kind of obvious when you look at it from that point of view that like, yeah, not everybody in the family over seven generations is going to be a drummer. Like, it's just that's not the way it's going to shake out. No, um, seven and, generations. Wow. Yeah, I'm I'm the seventh. Um, that's so cool. Unbelievable. Yeah. So if my brother worked here, there would be a drummer in the family that works here, but he does not work with the company. So uh, that's, that's just as, as luck would have it, he didn't and I did. Um, and I'm <laughs> not the drummer. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Cool. Well, I, I, like I said, I think that's really, um, I kind of like that. I think it's neat. And, and there's a lot of, you see old pictures of people working in like Slingerland factories or, or the Slingerland factory or Ludwig or, or Gretsch or wherever, where it'd be like old women, um, not to say that they weren't drummers, but they'd be like doing the wrapping of the drum shells or where mm -hmm. they're working there. And there's a good chance that these, these, you know, older women are aren't drummers. They're just doing this as a job. <laughs> you know, I think it's pretty right. common. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, but cool. like, I mean, I, I tend to think there's an extra sense of pride in having someone who can appreciate and play and enjoy the instrument doing some of those more mundane tasks that may seem thankless at the time. Definitely. But if, you know, if it's something that you're like, man, I might take this one home with me. Like there, there yeah. is that extra level of intent behind it. Yeah. Like you're so, and I think of that too. I'm like, you're, you're, you're so obsessed with our instrument that you're happy putting, um, screwing lugs on every day. <laughs> just, yep. Just cause you love drums. Um, cool. So that was basically in the 80s. Now, through the 90s, you were making drums like you had, you know, you were producing drums. Why don't you take us take us from there um, and on? And I probably just derailed us because we might be already past that. But yeah, why don't you guys just take us through, you know, up into the modern modern time? Well, once we had the uh, classic snare drum <clears throat> uh, process nailed down, uh, we it morphed into drum sets um, and we configured, you know, Tried to make a drum set with all horizontal plies to make it uh, like a solid wood steam bent uh, drum would be made out of plies. Uh, so we, you know, that was our Horizon series. <clears throat> uh, okay. We now have four different drum set lines, and we have expanded the species from just the maple that we started to nine different local hardwood species that we are steaming and bending now. Hmm. So, Got it. Where do you guys source your wood typically for this kind of stuff? It's all local. Um, everything comes, out, for the most part, from Granville or the surrounding towns. But every now and then we will have to drive a little further afield to pick it up. Um, but, you know, everything within an hour or so of the factory. You know, if we get really desperate for a maple, we'll walk across the street, find a maple in the woods and cut it down ourselves. Um, but everything comes really locally for a long time. There was a lumberjack in town. There's, there's one other business in this tiny little town that we're based out of. Uh, and it's a small little country store that serves coffee and stuff in the morning. And there was a lumberjack and a couple other guys that would get their, their, you know, their start of the day over there every morning. So if we knew that we needed maple, we'd drive over and say, Hey, when you're out in the woods today, look for a good straight, large maple and put our name on it. And, uh, he would knock it down and bring it up to a guy that ran a small mill in his backyard that would saw it to our rough blanks for us and then drop it here where we would, you know, plane it and do the prepping and, and put it through its process. That has recently yeah. changed. Um, we now have the mill here. Uh, that guy was getting out of that business and he was in his mid seventies. So we took over the mill from him and now it lives in one of our repurposed buildings here. So that kind of came back in house within the last month or two. Man, that's awesome. Most drum companies don't have access to a lumberjack who's sitting there drinking coffee waiting for uh <laughs> We are very fortunate coming. to have that. <laughs> for yeah, sure. That's that's so cool. Um now, can you explain a little bit? Well, let me ask. So and and I should probably know this, but are all of your shells steam bent shells? No. No. Okay. So what my question is then is on the steam bent shells, which do you, do you still do any steam bent shells or is it all just a different normal kind of, you know, shell building process now? We do. The steam bent drums are snares only. OK, OK. Um, I'm just totally curious. Can you explain how the steam bent process works a little bit? OK, uh, so right now we get a log. I put it on the sawmill, I slice it into half inch thick slabs uh, by nine inches wide. They come into the factory, we take and uh, plane them down to the proper thickness, cut them to length, put a scarf joint on the end of them. Uh, so the, when, you're, when they're curled and uh, overlapped, uh, the, glue, uh, the glue surface uh, ends up being the same thickness as the rest of the shell. Uh, we can bend batches of 34 drums at a time so we prep 34, put them in the steam chest, steam them for four, uh, three to four hours, run them through the bending machine um, into the forms, and then they'll have to age and cure for 10 to 12 weeks before we can then glue that lap uh, and put in the reinforcing hoop to turn it into a drum. So we have literally hundreds and hundreds of shells that are bent and in temporary forms, curing, waiting for the orders. Uh, so we have to have an inventory of right now, like I said, nine different species of woods, uh, all curing to a point where you could then grab them, glue the lap, put in the reinforcing hoops, turn them, and then paint and finish them. 
Man, that's fascinating. I'm where I live. I'm pretty close to like you know bourbon country and uh, Kentucky, and it kind of reminds me of that where you have to like plan way ahead. And mm-hmm. like um, like there was a distillery that opened pretty close by to where I am, and they it's like you can't just say all right we're going to open in a year. It's like, well, no, you need to age it for four years before you're even like legally allowed to, you know, do it. So, um, that's neat. That's a lot of planning ahead there. So then you guys obviously make the rest of your shells for the kit. Correct. That the, they wouldn't be steam bent snares are only steam bent. So everything else is made in house, right? No, the, the, the ply shells we do not make in house. Okay. Gotcha. Who do you, are those Keller or, um, we use a number of different suppliers for a different series. The the mainstays, the the long term kits here that we've had since kind of we started doing kits uh, have been with Keller the entire time, which are CD Maples and our Horizons have been with them forever. Awesome. Um, we added two other series of kits in the last five, three years, five years, um, and both of those come from other suppliers. Cool. We've we've definitely on this show. Um, we're very, uh, everyone who listens, I hope is on board with me of being very pro Keller. Cause I think there was, we've talked about it before where there's like, there's like a thing of like, Oh, it's a Keller kit, but it's like, no Keller makes very specific shells for companies. And there's, um, there was a Keller episode of the podcast, but, um, I mean, they just make unbelievable stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Every now and then we get, we get pushed back on that for, you know, Oh, they don't make their own shells. Like, yeah, we don't. Um, for those, we still steam bend all of our own solid shells. Um, and you know, Keller makes very specific things for very specific people. Like you couldn't call up Keller tomorrow and order our configuration for a horizon kit. You know, it's still our design. It was our prototypes. They just have the capacity to press the shells that we simply don't have being the small mom and pop company that we are. You know, each one of those presses is thousands and thousands of dollars that we just don't have the the infrastructure to be able to support right so no. we we specify the uh direction of plies the thickness of plies and species and they make that shell for us yeah yeah totally they again i i uh i think it's it's because there are keller shells that you can just get online and buy but that's not what companies like you and there's a number of other companies oh, yeah. out there and i think keller is just an awesome company um so Cool. Um, and now you guys are very, very um, popular in the drum world. Um, people, I just think people, you know, just you're probably so close to it that I can tell you that I think Noble and Cooley has this just level of like uh, craftsmanship and like expertise. Um, and I actually taught drums to a guy who um, this was years ago, but he he just learned he was um i don't think he would mind me saying pretty wealthy guy he was a lawyer he also owned movie theaters in town here and he wanted to learn and um his very first drum set that he bought was a five piece noble and cooley set which i was like okay mine was a <laughs> two piece percussion plus kit from mars music <laughs> so, <laughs> oh yeah bit of a discrepancy there but um so and and it's just you know I actually don't think he plays anymore. I think he stopped playing, which is sort of like a, what happened to that? Dr- yeah. You <laughs> should offer, take that off his hands. Yeah. I'll take it, man. I'll yeah. Um, but, uh, I remember him saying just when he got, I'm like, and, and I think it's not bad that if you have the means to start with a, a very, very high quality drum set, you're probably going to sound a little better than on your percussion plus kit with, you know, a tin symbol and, uh, and, and all that, but, um, he loved it. And I, I, I believe I've played some snares, um, at the Chicago show. Um, and they're just great drums. I mean, you guys, you guys have, should be very proud of, of what you've accomplished, you know, or being in your family, you should be very proud of the seven generations. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, now take us up to the modern day. I think we're, we're there, but like what's going on right now with Noble and Cooley, what's in the works, um, you know, who some endorses maybe who who is who's playing? Just you know, what's going on right now? Yeah, uh, it's honestly been a uh, strange and hectic, busy couple months here. Um, sure. My my mother is retiring, um, so that's that is kind of first and foremost of of the big changes. You know, she's been holding down the fort in the office for thirty six years now. Um, so finding somebody to step into her shoes is not an easy task. Um, so as far as what's happening right now, it's figuring out that, um, (laughs) but beyond that, we, uh, we have added a new series of kit in, uh, last month, right? It was mid September. I think we rolled that out. So we have a new series of kit that just came out. Um, 
We're already working on our next prototypes for a, a new snare, which might lead to a new series of kit that we hope to have coming out early next year. So always, always reinventing the wheel a little bit. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's it's um, it's really cool. I, I think that there's gonna be a lot of people who are listening to this episode who maybe didn't realize that you guys were like, let's say for, you know, 80 percent of your life line of being a company were a toy company. I think mm-hmm. that's a big takeaway. And that uh, I, I just love knowing that you guys are just literally like sourcing all of the wood. So so the snares, I mean, the snares are kind of known for being one of your your specialties, obviously. Um, yeah. Can people get them anywhere in particular or is it a made to order thing? Or I know you have there's the series where they're you're producing them. But um, where can people get them really? Yeah, so we work with a number of dealers across, well, across the globe, really. Um, But domestically, we have a number of really good dealers that do stock a whole bunch of snares. Um, Beyond that, the easiest way, you know, if you want something more special and custom built for you, is to go onto our website, drop us an email. It's going to be probably me that answers it, or maybe one of the other guys in the office. uh, And we'll talk about what you need for a custom build, and we'll set you up with a dealer in your area. We do not sell direct. Everything does end up having to go through a dealer because we do have a small network of shops that, you know, took the plunge on carrying our product. And, you know, they support us and we want to foster that that support and, you know, kind of grow that network. So, you know, we'll we'll more than happy to talk about all the specs and configurations of something that you want to build and then, you know, run that through one of the shops that we work with. But we do have a number of good dealers that do stock our drums. There's a full list of all of the the retailers that sell them over on our website. Gotcha. Yeah, that's cool. So, um, and then obviously people can visit noblecooley.com, N-O-B-L-E-C-O-O-L-E-Y.com. There's all kinds of stuff there. Now, and this is probably just like family stuff, obviously, but when did it switch from, when did the last name switch from Noble to Jones? I mean, obviously people get married and all that stuff through the generations, um, but how, how did that happen? Uh, it came down, obviously, on my on my mother's side of the family. Uh, sure. The second generation Coolies had a son and a daughter, and the son did not have any children, and so the company moved to his nephews uh, and his sister had married a man named Hires. My mother's maiden name was Hires. She married a man named Jones. So it is still direct bloodline family, but it cha- the name changed twice uh, coming through the maternal side of the f- branch. Gotcha. That's cool. Yeah. Man, 1854. There's uh, That's just it's so neat that it's still functioning. I mean, what, who would be maybe the next oldest drum company in, let's just say, America? Would that be... Ludwig, I know Rogers. I think is was in like, God, now I'm gonna like shoot myself in the I foot because I I've done an episode on it. But I think Rogers was originally in like Ireland or something making drum heads. But Ludwig would maybe be the oldest. That would be my guess, but I yeah. really don't know. I don't know. I, you'd have to research and find out when Gretsch actually got started. I'm not sure. I have to listen back to my own. Well, there's a Gretsch episode. I think. <laughs> oh, I think Gretsch was. I think it was 1898. Um, and I'm going to now, um, oh, 1883 was Gretsch. Uh, they're, so They're rookies. <laughs> they're rookies. The, who are the new kids on the block here? <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is great. Any other cool little um, tidbits about the company or anything like that that you guys want to do? Do you still make any rope tension drums? We don't. Um, so we did for the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. We took that marching drum that we were talking about earlier out of the glass case and had the wood identified um, because it's, you know, old and painted and not easily recognizable at a glance um, and discovered that it was Tulip, uh, which is, you know, pretty readily available up here. Um, So for the 150th anniversary of the war to commemorate it, we built a limited number of rope tension drums using Tulip wood uh, in the, you know, the same jigs and fixtures done the same way that we would have done it for the Civil War, and we made just a small number of those. So that was the last rope tension that we did, but that actually led to, we figured, okay, well, we're steam bending Tulip, we should do a modern snare drum out of that just to see what it looks like side by side. Take a picture of it, you know, put it up on social media and laugh. Um, Mm. We still, I don't believe, have actually taken that photo. 
Um, but as it turns out, Tulip is an amazing sounding wood and it is one of our most popular selling solid shell snare drums to date. And the kit that we just introduced last month, we named the Union Series. Um, and it is made out of 100% Tulip. Hmm. Wow. It sounds... I don't know much. I need to learn. I guess I need to do an episode on it. I don't know that much about the... I'm not a big wood guy, and I want to be, where I want to know all the differences, um, where I'm not as familiar with Tulip, um, you know, anything about it. So I have to research that more. That's really cool. So the reason it was used originally um, was that it was extremely lightweight. So, I mean, as we noted earlier, drummer boys were typically that. They were young children, you know, wearing wool uniforms who are responsible for communicating with people in the field that if they couldn't hear them or communicate, people were dying. So there were very strict penalties if the if the boy was caught without his drum. So it needed to be something that they could carry and have with them at all times. So beyond what it sounded like, you know, they were built as a tool of communication, not as a good sounding instrument. Um, so that was its primary function was that it was light and portable. Um, so it is a very soft, warm, deep sounding wood, which lends itself to a very nice sounding, modern built, vintage sounding drum kit. Interesting. And you said it's very readily available. It's not like, you know, Bubinga or whatever. Again, I'm not a wood guy. But no, no like it, it, is, it is one of the largest indigenous trees to New England. Oh, okay. Uh, they'll grow up to uh, 10 foot in circumference. Yeah. And, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, and they grow nice and straight. Uh, we actually uh, went out last last spring. Yeah. And because uh, we couldn't get a, a, a tulip log, the... Uh, our logger couldn't get into the woods because of mud and whatever. And so across the street from the factory up on the property, there was a beautiful tree that was uh, like three feet across and it's 60 feet to the first branch. So I harvested that and turned it into a bunch of drums. Mm. So cool to think that you guys are out there just getting these trees and uh, then people are fast forward, you know, however long the steam bending and all that they're, they're being played. They're making music. That's just amazing. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, um, I think that's great. I, I uh, oh, let, this is kind of a selfish last question, but I want to get one. How do people go about getting um, the tin drum that you guys make? Because it's it's actually sort of. I had a little bit of trouble finding one. I think I could only find one at one shop online, and it sold out. So, what's the best way to get a um, a tin drum? So they used to be listed directly for sale on our website. Yeah, um, I thought they still were. If not. Uh, if I'm wrong about that, we do also have a museum web- website set up that is NCCHP, um, which is NC- uh, Noble and Cooley Center for Historic Preservation. So nchp.org, And there is a little web store on there that has toy drums on it. Uh, and beyond that, shoot me an email. Nick, okay. N-I-C-K at noblecooley.com. And I'll help you out. Awesome. Yeah, I'm on uh, nchp.com. Or, I'm sorry, nchp.org. Yep, right. Um, there, there's a link on the bottom of our homepage of our regular website. Oh, yeah. Okay, I see it right there. And there you go. There's the ice bucket and all that stuff. And, okay, now just questions are coming to me. So when you guys said before that you were making, you got into the gift, you know, realm. So yeah. really, if something <clears throat> is, you know, a vintage drum-looking item, like like you said, a wastebasket or an ice bucket or a table, there's a decent chance that that was made by noble and cooley then right yep definitely in the uh, in the 50s 60s and 70s yes cool because I've, I've seen tons of that stuff and i have a little table that's like a rope tension drum that's just turned you know it's actually just a table but um now i'm gonna go and <laughs> yeah that's definitely ours <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool man i know it's not like i'm sure it's not valuable because it's just a table and all that stuff but it just feels cool knowing like oh it's noble and cooley <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, there's awesome. there's a number of them out there. Uh, I think for a number of years, like all of my friends in high school ended up getting like drum shaped seats that had storage in them as we were going off to college and whatnot. So, and so they're cool. around. Awesome. Well, this is great because I learned where to get the tin drum. Um, so that's really cool for me. And uh, awesome. Well, I hope everyone out there really enjoyed this episode. Um, so many people reached out. I just can't. Uh, first, I would just. Really, Don McCauley, who you guys, you know, did some work with, um, who's just been a big, obvious, long friend of the show. Um, Mark Robertson, who's um, was pushing me to get you guys on. And then, like I said, literally 
too many to to think of. Um, thank you to everyone who did suggest Noble and Cooley. Um, it's been it's been one of those things where I just think, am I re- these guys have to hate me because I keep emailing them? But we've- <laughs> <laughs> not at all, <laughs> not a bit. Okay, because we're we're now we're done. We've done it, and I'll, I'll leave you alone. But um, great, um, Jay, Nick, I want to thank you guys um, again. It's Noble dot com to go and actually check out the amazing drums they're making. Um, and then it was nchp.org to go look for. Um, they have all kinds of other stuff on there. You have a cutting board that looks like a duck. You have all kinds of wood stuff. Um, so thank you guys for being on the show and taking the time to do this. This has been great. Of right, course. Welcome. Thanks for Thanks for having us on. It's been great. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.